Switching to class five, where you introduce uh, the readings from volume three on merchants' capital for the first time. So it's a very interesting sort of historical take by Marx, where he sees merchant capital as a, a pre-capitalist economic formation that eventually becomes subsumed by productive or industrial capital and, and, and suits its purposes. And that there is a, a certain way that Marx seems to say that that's sort of just the historical way of things. But you've pointed out that, you know, if we look at the last 20 or 30 years, the rise of merchant capital in the United States and in the global economy seems very, very striking. And in some ways, reversing that type of relationship uh, of sort of who's on top. Um, and I'm wondering if you could reflect a little bit about that or maybe share an example. The way Marx presents it is indeed that, you know, once upon a time, merchants rose, you know, roamed the world and thieved and fraudulently engaged in all kinds of practices. And in effect, they got their money by gaining assets for almost nothing and then selling dear. And sometimes when they did pay for it, they, they paid for a little and then they sold for a lot. So that's how merchant capital came into being initially. And Marx kind of uh, says, well, that's not tolerable for a fully functioning capitalist system and therefore the merchant capitalists have to come in line and the way he puts it makes it seem as if that socially they are actually put under the domination of the producers. The producers then dominate the merchants and the merchants simply do the producers bidding. Uh, well we now have a situation where in many instances the producers do the merchants bidding. Uh, that uh, Ikea or Walmart dominates the producers. So that social relationship has indeed been reversed. But it is still the case that there is something different about merchant capital today than was the case in, say, the 15th, 16th centuries. Because what the merchant capitalist does today is to dominate producers who are creating surplus value in production. That Ikea and Walmart and take Nike, for example. Nike doesn't actually produce anything. It organizes the producers. The producers extract the surplus value and we see all these accounts of what it, you know, Nike works are like. It's horribly extractive. Vast amounts of surplus value is being produced there. So merchant capital is still dependent upon the production of surplus value as its source of profit in ways that was not true, say, in the 15th and 16th century when they simply robbed the royal blind of, 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 of value. So there is a sense in which merchant capital is still subsumed under the necessity of producing surplus value, it's just that they are the ones who are organizing its production. So there is a sense in which subsumed means something different now than it meant back then. Walmart is, is expert, it organizes all of these factories in China and all the rest of it and, and, and vast, that's where the surplus value is coming from. So. So I think that uh, that's the way we should look at it now, uh, which comes back in general, if there's a class of merchant capitalists and a class of producers, in some spheres uh, the producers are dominant. For example, uh, General Motors generally dominates over the retailers, but Walmart, on the other hand, dominates over the producers. So the relationship between the producers and the merchants varies depending upon what area of production we're talking about and it also depend, depends a little bit on the historical and geographical situation. Our task this week is to begin upon looking at uh, the sections in uh, Volume 3, and we're going to be reading uh, all of uh, Part 4 and uh, as much as we can stand of part five. Uh, part four, which you should have read for this week, I think you will say doesn't pose any uh, grand problems over and above the normal problems you have, have, have been having in the text in general, so it, it fits pretty well, I think, with the general tenor of what was being done in, in, in volume two. But uh, part five uh, is another story. And uh, I think I should alert you to this because, uh, you know, when we get into part five, 
I think uh, you're going to find it's rather different. Uh, here is Engels writing about uh, how he went about reconstructing Volume 3 of Capital, and he says, it was Part 5 that presented the major difficulty. And this was also the most important subject in the entire book, and I, you can see why, because a number of times Marx has mentioned the credit system and all that, it's just again and again and again. Marx was engaged in elaborating precisely this part when he was attacked by one of the serious illnesses he referred to above. Here, therefore, we did not have a finished draft, or even an outline plan to be filled in, but simply the beginning of an elaboration which petered out more than once in a disordered jumble of notes, comments and extract material." Now, if Engels said that, says that, you know it's pretty bad. <laughs> and he then says, I sought at first to complete this part by filling in the gaps and elaborating the fragments that were simply indicated, as I had more or less managed to do with part one, so that it would at least contain, by and large, everything the author had intended to include. I made at least three attempts to do this, but failed on each occasion and the time that was thereby lost is one of the main reasons for the delay in publication. I finally realised that this way was hopeless, I would have had to go through the whole of the literature in this field and would have produced something at the end of it that was not Marx's book. The only alternative was to make a fresh start, confine myself to arranging the material as best I could and make only the most necessary alterations." Uh, he then goes on to talk about some of the individual chapters, uh, and he then kind of says, well, things really get difficult after chapter 30. And, and he then kind of says, and then, there was then followed in the manuscript a long section headed, The Confusion, <laughs> 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 consisting simply of extracts from the parliamentary reports of the crises of 1848 and 1857, in which the statements of some 23 businessmen and economic writers, particularly on the subjects of money and capital, the drain of gold over speculation, etc., were collected with the occasional addition of brief humorous comments. And, you know, so, so part five, believe you me, is a mess. When I, I was trying to work my way through it, it, it drove me crazy, and it probably will drive you a bit crazy, but I think it's important uh, that you take a look, and the way, I think, in which you have to do it is you, you have to take each chapter and rather than try and get out of it uh, an, an argument uh, and, and, and get a flow of an argument of the sort that you can get out of Volume 1 and, 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 and out of Volume 2, at least significant parts of Volume 2, what you have to do is you go to a chapter and say, is there anything interesting being said in here? And, and when you see something interesting, pull it out and say, well, okay, I'm going to hang on to that, and then you hang on to this, and then you have to try to reconstruct uh, something of what Marx was thinking about and ask yourself the question, how relevant is this uh, to us uh, today? So. Part five is, as I said, say a, 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 a real, uh, real difficult. But I think when we when we get to it, there's sufficient content in there. Uh, if, by doing it in the way I've suggested, sufficient content in there that we can uh, actually bring it back into the context of volume two and start to understand what might happen when Marx throws in one of those side lines about, well, of course this looks completely different when you. Uh, start to consider the credit system or, or, or something of that kind, so you can start to get a better feel uh, for it. So that's what we're going to do now. The two parts, however, uh, I think have to be read uh, again with a certain understanding of what Marx's intent was. And when he starts chapter 16, this is on page 379, he says this, Merchants or trading capital is divided into two forms or subspecies, commercial capital and money-dealing capital. And as you will have recognised from the chapter on money-dealing capital, that's the beginnings, if you like, of moving into the whole kind of credit world and money world and all the rest of it. So, all right, we're going to deal in part four and part five with commercial capital, money-dealing capital, credit system and the like. And, but then he adds the following comment, which we shall go on to distinguish in such detail as is needed in order to analyse capital in its basic inner structure. Now, I think it's very important to understand what that qualifier means. It goes back, if you like, to the argument I was making about 
when I took those passages from the Grundrisse, that Marx is concerned with the generality of production. He doesn't want to get too embroiled in the particularities of distribution, or what's going on in the world of exchange, and he certainly doesn't want to get embroiled in the world of singularities. So he wants to stay in that level of generality, and he wants to analyse merchants' capital and money capital and the credit system only in so far as they enter into affecting the laws of motion as you, of capital as they are being laid out in this general theory of the level of generality. In other words, he's not going to talk about everything there is. Again, I think you will see, as you will have seen in the, the sections on merchant capital, there's a, a sort of circumscribed way in which he's approaching it. And he's putting limitations on himself and certain exclusions. I mean, he doesn't sort of say directly, well, this belongs to the sort of the particularity and I'm not going to go into it, but you can sense a lot of the time that he's trying to ward off getting too deeply into the particularities. He wants to stay at the level of theoretical elaboration, and you know, for, for the reasons that I outlined in the first lecture. But in both of these chapters then, uh, or both of these parts, he's, he's not concerned with everything there is that's going on in the credit system, although when you get into, f into the finance stuff you see that in a sense he is beginning to do that, <laughs> and, and it's creating a, that's part of the reason why I think it's such a hell of a mess, you know, it's, it, it, that he couldn't figure out what was inside of the general uh, structure and what was outside, and, and, and that was, that's part of, of the, 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 the problem. But the second thing that's going on here, and I think we have to watch this very, very carefully, uh, is, is really set out, uh, I think, most clearly on page 428. And the bottom paragraph there says this, As the reader will have recognised in dismay, the analysis of the real inner connections of the capitalist production process, this is the level of generality, right, is a very intricate thing and a work of great detail. It is one of the tasks of science to reduce the visible and merely apparent movement to the actual inner movement. Accordingly, it will be completely self-evident that in the heads of the agents of capitalist production and circulation, ideas must necessarily form about the laws of production that diverge completely from these laws and are merely the expression in consciousness of the apparent movement. The ideas of a merchant a stock jobber or a banker, are necessarily quite upside down. The ideas of the manufacturers are vitiated by the acts of circulation to which their capital is subjected, and by the equalisation of the general rate of profit. And then he talks also, goes on next about competition. Notice what he's saying here, you've got to be very, very careful not to, to believe how merchant capitalists think of themselves, or how bankers think of themselves. In other words, by definition almost, in Marx's definition, they are deluded. I mean, not deluded in the stupid sense, they're deluded in the fetishistic sense. Remember when Marx, in defining fetishism, said, well, fetishism is not just that somebody imagines something, it really is like that up front when you, when you look at it, on the surface. But underneath is something completely different. And Marx is trying to find out what's going on underneath. So we've got to be very careful about dealing with the self-perceptions of the bankers and the financiers. I find this a very, very interesting thing, because you read all these memos coming out of Wall Street by Wall Street bankers, and the self-perception in there is of a certain sort. And I think what Marx would say, you've got to turn it upside down to think about what's really going on, and it's maybe you've got to turn it inside out as well, and you've got to turn it every which way. So what we're getting right now in the financial press, and the you know, financial sections of the New York Times and all the rest of it, is an account which is very much based on the self-perception of what these people do. 
And I keep getting told by people, well, you don't really know what they do. And I say, I don't care what they do because they're, they're deluded in what they're doing anyway, so I want to find out what the theory is that underpins what the hell they are about in the dynamics of capital. And that's what it seems to me is the Marxist approach. And what Marx is trying to do here is to do that. Now, whether he does it correctly or not is another matter, and I think we can have a discussion about that. But when, but when we criticize what he does, or if we criticize what he does, then you can't do it by kind of saying, well, you know, I talked to this banker and the banker said, ah, this is all nonsense there, you know. Because you'd expect the banker to say that, you know. You know, so, so I, I think this is a very telling kind of passage. And, and one that you have to import into an understanding of what's, what's going on and how, you, you know, how, you're, how you're going to read, read this. So you have to read it that he, okay, he's, and, but one of, the, one of the ways in which he's going to recognize what it is that the bankers are really about or what it is that the merchants are really about, one of the ways you're going to recognize that is precisely by staying at the level of generality. You're not going to get it if you get too far into the particularity. And I see that was his strategic decision. But again, you know, it's not clear what is in the generality and what's not, and so we're going to get into some discussions of this sort as, as we go on. So that is, if you like, a, 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 the background to part four and, 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 and part, part five. Now, I suggested you start uh, part four with the historical chapter, so I'm going to start on that too. Where these issues I've just been discussing, I think, do come up in certain ways which are uh, potentially significant. For the first couple of pages, he's talking about some of the stuff he's been writing before, so we won't go into that. Um, but he starts off on 442 by saying, quite simply, uh, that uh, we have to understand that trading capital, he says, is older than the capitalist mode of production, and is in fact the oldest historical mode in which capital has an independent existence. As we saw in the argument earlier, commercial activity trading of goods and services and commodities and all this kind of stuff was a necessary precondition for the rise of capital as a class relation, okay? And, and that necessary precondition is going to be created largely by the activities of the traders and, and the merchants. Because what the traders and the merchants did was, if in effect, to mediate between different sectors uh, of different pre-capitalist modes of production. And as he says at the bottom, towards the bottom of 442, commercial capital simply mediates the movement of these extremes, that is, things that are produced here and are in surplus and over there and somebody wants them and sort of trade between pre-capitalist social formations. It simply mediates the movement of these extremes, the commodities, as preconditions already given to it. But then he goes on to say that the extent to which production goes into trade and passes through the hands of merchants depends on the mode of production. You know, if you're dealing with a largely self-sufficient peasant society, uh, which is self-sufficient and is producing a little bit of surplus which is willing to engage in trade, then there's not much business to be done. You may take it from place, you know, a merchant may come along and take that surplus and pay it part A and and, and, and you know, place A and, and, and try to find somebody, place B, who wants it in exchange for surplus over there. So, so in, a chain, in, a, in a sense, it's just an exchange of surplus products, which, le which are over and above the self-sufficiency that exists in those societies. Um, and in this case, the mode of production is not capitalist at all. What is, product, what is capitalist is the, the, the beginnings of trade in surplus products. And he says that really what, the, on 443, he says, the function of commercial capital is reducible to the functions of exchanging different commodities for one another and the transformation of commodities into money, selling and, 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 and the like. So the merchant, as he says a bit further down, buys and sells for many people. 
sales and purchases are concentrated in his hands, and in this way buying and selling cease to be linked with the direct needs of the buyer. So the merchant doesn't buy for, 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 for his own use, he, he buys to sort of find to somebody else. But out of this, of course, the merchant, merchant starts to accumulate capital. And this is what starts also to be a precondition for the rise of capitalist production, that is, the precondition of the formation of, a, of, a, of, a, of a formation of money uh, and, and, and the like. As, as capital gets going, uh, then you start to see something different. As he says on 444 towards the bottom, in the context of capitalist production, commercial capital is demoted from its earlier separate existence to become a particular moment of capital invested in general. And the equalization of profits reduces its profit rate to the general average. It now functions simply as the agent of productive capital. The particular social conditions that form with the development of commercial capital no longer play a determining part here. On the contrary, where commercial capital predominates, obsolete conditions obtain. This is true even within the same country, where, for example, purely trading cities exhibit a far greater analogy with past conditions than do manufacturing towns. This is a very interesting observation at, in the 17th, 18th centuries, for example, in Britain, the cities, the, tr the trading cities, were extremely conservative around the question of the mode of production. They had guild formation, they had uh, associations, they had corporatist systems, so capital did not arise in places like uh, Bristol, Norwich, you know, the trading cities, it didn't arise there at all, in the sense of the production. Capital ended up arising in places which were not like that, i.e. the villages with names like Manchester and Birmingham and all the rest of it. And, and I think Marx is quite right to kind of say, you know, wherever the merchants are hegemonic, and merchant forms of organization and corporatism and all the rest of it are hegemonic and dominant, that doesn't give much space for the industrial capital to get going and for the, the, the production, you know, the wage labor, uh, capitalist mode of production to get going. And I think this is a, in itself an interesting historical observation, which leads him then to say, on top of 445, that the independent development of commercial capital thus stands in inverse proportion to the general economic development of society. Then he tells the story, if you like, a bit further down, middle of the page. Capital as capital, therefore, appears first of all in the circulation process. In this circulation process, money develops into capital. It is in circulation that the product first develops as an exchange value, as commodity and money. Capital can be formed in the circulation process and must be formed there before it learns to master its extremes. The extremes, of course, are in production. And then he talks about what happens when circulation has still not mastered production, but is related to it simply as it's given precondition. This is what we were talking about earlier, about, you know, those forms of circuit of money capital and, 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 and commodity capital are preconditions. But then he kind of says, in capitalist production, on the contrary, both these things are the case. The production process is completely based on circulation, and circulation is a mere moment and a transition phase of production. And then he says, the law, this is on 446, the law that the independent development of commodity capital stands in inverse proportion to the level of development of capitalist production appears particularly clearly in the history of the carrying trade. And so he's now going to be talking about Venetians, Genoans, Dutch, and all the rest of it. And then he talks about uh, <coughs> the gradual support towards the bottom of the page, a particular form which the subordination of commercial capital to industrial capital takes with the progressive development of capitalist production. And he then says, and the manner and form in which commercial capital operates where it dominates production directly. A striking example is given not only by the colonial trade and the colonial system. And then he talks about the Dutch East Indies. So 
the general story that is being told here is again and again articulated, as again on 448. He says, in the stages that preceded capitalist society, it was trade that prevailed over industry. In modern society, it is the reverse. Trade naturally reacts back to a greater or lesser extent on the communities between which it is pursued. It subjects production more and more to exchange value by making consumption and existence more dependent on sale than on the direct use of the product. In this way, it dissolves the old relationships. Now, there's a very interesting argument here, which is also very strongly articulated in the Grundrisse, sir, about the dissolution of old modes of production by the penetration of commodity forms and money forms, and it is trading capital that largely engages in that process. Uh, he, in the Grundrisse, he makes this interesting kind of kind. He says, you know, money destroys the old society. It destroys the community, and then money becomes the community. And we live under the conditions of the community of money, not of the community of people. Which is a very interesting kind of way of looking at it. And again, on 448, trade increases monetary circulation. It no longer just takes hold of surplus production, but gradually gobbles up production itself and makes entire branches of production dependent on it. This solvent effect, again, this dissolution of the dissolving effect however, depends very much on the nature of the community of producers. And then he introduces, as he does in the theory of primitive accumulation at the end of Volume 1 of Capital, the fact that commercial capital, that right at the bottom, when it, uh, 448, when it holds a dominant position is thus in all cases a, a system of plunder. And, and uh, it's about violent plunder, piracy, the taking of slaves, the subjugation of colonies, um, but in, through that process, he then says on 449, it always gives a growing orientation towards exchange value, expands its scope, diversifies it, and rend renders it cosmopolitan. And by this, of course, we start to see that value starts to be the hidden regulator. But it's only through this process that value starts to become, if you like, the hidden regulator uh, of the way in which capitalism was working. Again, he says further, trade always has, to a greater or lesser extent, a solvent effect on the pre-existing organizations of production. But how far it leads to the dissolution of the old mode of production depends first and foremost on the solidity and inner articulation of this mode of production itself. That is, there's a lot of conjunctural elements here. Trade was very well developed in China, and it was engaging in this kind of thing, but it was solidly organized in such a way that, that capitalism could not break through. Uh, the monopoly power of, uh, of the merchant centres in, in, in many parts of Europe and Britain was such as to prevent uh, production capital breaking through into its own. And it only when it went to greenfield sites, like, like as I've already mentioned. Um, so, and there are various things that then happen. And he then talks in 450 about the dependence of trade on urban development. And a little bit further down, there can be no doubt that the great revolutions that took place in trade in the 16th and 17th centuries, along with the geographical discoveries of that epoch, and which rapidly advanced the development of commercial capital, were a major moment in promoting the transition from the feudal to the capitalist mode of production. The sudden expansion of the world market, multiplication of commodities in circulation, the competition among the European nations for the seizure of Asiatic products and American treasures, the colonial system, all made a fundamental con contribution towards shattering the feudal barriers to production. And he then goes on to talk about the creation of the world market uh, and the defeat of the old mode of production. Uh, this is on 451. And in a sense, uh, this also has geographical shifts in it. For instance, he, he argues in the middle of 451, the history of Holland's decline as a dominant trading nation is the history of the subordination of commercial capital to industrial capital. And uh, as those of you who are familiar with Giovanni Arrighi's work will know that he talks a lot about the hegemonic shift from the Dutch hegemony of the world system to the British hegemony of the world system, the difference being that the, that the British had, could organize a mode of production which was a capitalist mode of production, the Dutch could not. 
in part because of the strength of their trading corporations and, and all the rest of it, but partly also because for, you know, for, for, for other reasons. They didn't have the places and the spaces to be able to, be able to do it. So that the shift to Britain of the centre of capital was crucial. And Marx talks again about the systems of, of plunder and, and, and the relationship of British imperial practices to India, China, destroying, destroying older modes of production. But then he makes, I think, a very interesting argument on 452-453. He says, the transition from the feudal mode of production takes place in two different ways. Actually, he says three different ways on the next page, but... Uh, uh, the first way on the next page is the merchant becomes an industrialist directly. Uh, going back to 452, the producer may become a merchant and capitalist in contrast to the agricultural natural economy and the guild-bound handicraft of medieval urban industry. This is the really revolutionary way. Alternatively, however, the merchant may take direct control of production himself. But however frequently this occurs as a historical tradition, and he then mentions this, it cannot bring about the overthrow of the old mode of production by itself, but rather preserves and retain it, retains it as its own precondition. This method, he says at the right at the bottom of 452, always stands in the way of the genuine capitalist mode of production and disappears with its development. And he then talks about the example of Tower Hamlets, and I want to come back to that uh, in a minute. So the story then is sort of fairly, fairly simple, that trading capital, merchants' capital, got the whole thing going. It created the preconditions for a capitalist mode of production. It even created, however, barriers to a capitalist mode of production. But when the capitalist mode of production came through, trading was made subordinate and merchant capital is made subordinate to the circulation of industrial capital and subordinate to productive capital. And <coughs> he then kind of says at the end, the first theoretical treatment of the modern mode of production, mercantilism, necessarily proceeded from the superficial phenomena of the circulation process. Hence it only grasped the semblance of things. This was partly because commercial capital is the first independent mode of existence of capital in general. The genuine science of modern economics, which Marx wants to be in, begins only when the theoretical discussion moves from the circulation process to the production process. Interest-bearing capital too is an age-old form of capital, but we shall see later why mercantilism did not take this as its basis, but rather engaged in polemics with it. So here's the story that is told. And one of the big questions it was seen to me is to what degree this is the right story? And what do we make of it in the contemporary conditions? And is this something which was, while it may have been historically correct, what has happened since? What do we make of Ikea, for example. What do we make of The Gap, Liz Claiborne, Benetton, Nike, Adidas, all of whom are actually merchant capitalists? They don't engage in production at all. Are they simply subordinate to production capital? Or is production capital subordinate to them? I mean, when you read the stuff about, you know, the conditions under which you know, people making clothing for the Gap or, or, or whoever are working in Central America or wherever, you would say it's almost exactly what he's saying here about what happens when merchant capital is in control. Right? I mean, these passages where he kind of says, without revolutionizing the mode of production, it worsens the conditions of the direct producers, transforms them into mere wage laborers and proletarians under worse conditions than those directly subsumed by capital. 
appropriating their surplus labour on the basis of the old mode of production. Leave aside the old mode of production for the moment. Isn't it, isn't it the case that some of the most exploitative labour conditions you can find anywhere in the world are precisely those which are subcontracting to the merchant capitalists? Isn't that, you know? Or am I deluded because it's a surface appearance? And in what sense am I deluded? By looking at the surface appearance and Marx coming back and saying, ah, but you're not looking at what's going on underneath. Come on, hey, come on. So, so what do we make of this story? And, and when he kind of says the only revolutionary way, as he says, you know, the revolution, the truly revolutionary way, is for the producer to sort of revolutionize everything and then subordinate merchant capital to its purpose. I mean, what do you think? I mean, I mean, is this? Do you think this is a plausible story, or should we should we actually at this point say, look, I, I don't think this is quite right, particularly in relationship to contemporary conditions, because if you look at the reorganisation of capital since the uh, 1970s, you've seen the rise of all of these merchant capitalists who subcontract to uh, Taiwanese capital under the most god awful kind of labouring conditions. And you can go find accounts of it all over the place. I mean, you know, and this is what some of the, you know, the anti-sweatshop people are about. College campuses kind of saying, you know, and the, the pressure on Nike to certify that it's, it's, not, it's not doing this kind of stuff. And in the whole kind of movement of the 1990s uh, around some of these questions was a movement which was precisely against, it was targeting the merchant capitalists as the ones who were, 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 were guilty, if you like, of, of, of subcontracting, right? So are we going to depart from Marx here, or are we going to say Marx is right? And if Marx is right, how is he right? Yeah. I mean, these are two different questions. The first question is, is he right in terms of the genesis of industrial capitalism, yeah. that capital first developed in trade and then became subservient? And the second question, is, which is completely apart, is he right for the further development uh, today? These are two different questions. Well, there's, there's, a, there's a question at the time, too, I think, actually. Yeah? I guess I don't quite understand why, how Nike and Vinton are considered merchant capitals. I mean, maybe I just don't understand what that term means, but it seems, I mean, I don't know much about it, but like if, if Nike is producing shoes over in Asia somewhere, I mean, wherever, whoever's producing those wouldn't be producing those if, if Nike yeah, of course. No, no, that's right. I mean, they're, they're, the, they're the capitalists who are organizing production, but, but essentially they do the design, they do the marketing, they do all that kind of thing. Uh, and and uh, what they then do is they find a subcontractor somewhere and say, okay, you take care of the production, here's the shoe, here's how it has to be made, this is what it has to look like, uh, this is its specifications, and it's all very worked out, and here's the... and, and you go do it, and, and you're responsible uh, for doing it, and you hire your loan laborer, and you set up your own machinery, and you do all those kinds of things. So they're the direct producers. Nike does not hire any workers to actually produce anything. It actually, actually goes to another firm and says, you do the producing. We are simply, in other words, if you look at that circuit of industrial capital, it sits at the merchant point and says, we are simply engaging in the merchant practices. We're not, we're not actually engaging in, in, in the production. And, and that's tr that, that, it's very interesting the number of firms that came up like that. I mean, Benetton is a classic. Benetton itself never produced anything. It, it, it set up the designs and the, and the fashion, this kind of stuff, and then found all kinds of these little firms to, to, to take care of it. Now, what they do is they contract and kind of say, okay, we're going to pay you so much per pair of shoes or shirt or whatever. So the, the subcontractor has a price, and then it's up to them what they do with their labor. And one of the reasons why you get this appalling kind of labor practices in those firms is because the price is set, obviously, reasonably low. 
and, the, and then the, the, the firm entering in, doing the, the production, is going to want to try to maximize its profit as much as it can, so it will engage in, 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 in all of the appalling practices you can, you can go read about. Uh, you know, there's extensive literature on it. So, it, it's, it's, it, you know, so, so that is the organizational form which exists right now, which seems to go against, it seems to me, what, what Marx is talking about here. Yeah. Well, that, that's in many ways a fiction, though. I, I know at least with the agribusiness, when, when say, when Tyson subcontracts, uh, they're like, well, we're not you know, growing the chicken, right. but right. they're ordering every single part of the production yeah. process. Yeah. They're saying what type of chicken to use, what type of feed to use, what type of input yeah. to use. What I mean, they are codifying every single step of the production process. They're just trying to maintain a fiction for liability purposes, I imagine it's probably to a large degree the same for all these <laughs> other types of industries where, where they're doing the subcontracting. And I mean, does, doesn't the issue of monopoly rents come in? Um, well, I'll we'll leave those aside for the moment. I mean, you know, we we'll want to get into, to, but, but I mean, <coughs> no, I mean, I think you're right. And I mean, and this raises the question to what degree is, to, in what way, just to take it very concretely, is, is, is Tyson uh, a merchant capitalist, and to what degree is it subservient to the requirements of production? Financially, it's not subservient. The power relation is it, the power relation is all on Tyson's <laughs> side. <coughs> in the same way, the power relation is all on Nike's side, and it's all on it's, it's, the power relation is there. <coughs> it's a lopsided power relation, and it resides with the merchant, not with the producers. And it seems to me that one of the things you would, and some of the language in here suggests that the producers are going to be the bosses of the, of the merchants. I mean, the language in here definitely suggests that. Whereas we live in a reality where in large segments of the economy it's the other way around. In other words, it's, you know. now, is this, is this simply that we're in a different stage of capitalism and that this was accurate for Marx's time? You know? I mean, can we think of counterexamples today where the producers do have the, the, you know, the balance of force on their side? Oh, I'm sure you can, yeah. So, I mean, could we say there's maybe, uh, you know, like a class division within the capitalist class here and there's a dialectic in the power relation based on, you know, struggle? Well, yes, you could you could say that, but but I but I think that the point is that this is what I, the phenomena I'm talking about is not a minor part of the economy. It's a major part of the economy. The Walmart, IKEA, Gap, Benetton, UK, Nike, Adidas. You know, you just go on down the line. They're all of a merchant, and, and there's vast areas of uh, the economy that are of that sort. And most of the electronics are almost all electronics are produced this way. Apple doesn't produce anything. I, I mean, so, so, so the form of organization in contemporary capitalism is heavily dominated by a situation in which the merchant moment is, if you like, hegemonic and dominant, and the power relation lies very much with the merchants. And not, you know, that's, that's not true in car production, for example. I mean, that's one of the problems of car production. They actually have to produce cars, you know. And, and, and so they are responsible for labor, and, and so they have to get into labor negotiations, whereas Nike doesn't have to get into labor negotiations. All it has to do is get the subcontractor, let them take care of the labor. Which is why you get these ultra-exploitative things that Marx talks about. This is a very interesting structural argument. If it's like this, then you're going to get ultra-exploitative ultra practices. Which which is very convenient for capital. So, so I think that, that, that Marx is right about that. But the general argument here, it seems to me, is a little bit problematic. Yeah. I was going to ask if the, if the question it does raise is maybe the kind of stage-like um, sequence that Marx suggests of uh, productive capital more or less revolutionizes and replaces merchant capital. And then precisely because of the changes in geography that cap capital can right move in and out of different sectors in different places. Yeah, I mean, one of the ways in which you can, you can uh, take this is to say, well, this, was, this may be correct uh, for what was going on in, the, say, the, the transformation that occurred between 1780 and 1850 in British 
industry and all the rest of it. Uh, and, but, uh, you know, capitalism has evolved and, and there is a movement of a power in this power relation. But notice, this gets us a little bit into the realm of particularity, which is what's the power relation between the, <laughs> the, uh, the merchants and the, and the producers, and the direct producers, if you can clearly separate them. Sometimes you can't really clearly separate them, but there was the power relation between them. Yeah. And Marx doesn't want to really deal with that too much. So, so there's, a, there's a very interesting kind of set of questions here as to, you know, how, how, do we, how do we read this? Do we read this and kind of say, well, this is one of those moments in Capital where Marx is talking about his contemporary reality and it's a reasonable representation of his contemporary reality, but we just can't take it as kind of representative of our reality. We have to go and kind of say, well, what is this power relation about these days? And we therefore have to kind of say, well, how do the general laws of motion of capital look when the power relation is heavily shifting towards the power of merchant capital? We're going to have the same problem with finance capital, by the way. When, when there's a big shift of this kind, what, 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 what does that mean for the general laws of motion? Or are we being deluded like, you know, by, by looking at surface appearances and not, not seeing you know, what's, what's really underneath? Yeah. Um, I think what a lot of the questions have been pointing to is <coughs> when you're so when you're structuring the production process so thoroughly as someone like IQ is doing, it's difficult to say that you're not uh, blurring the line between producer and merchant. And I think with regard to the last question, it might make sense to say that Nike is parading as a merchant when it's really the producer. Well, it's not a producer. It doesn't actually it doesn't actually hire labor and produce anything. You know, it's not. And I, I, you know, I can see what you, 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 you want to say, and you want to say, oh, well, they're really a producer, but they're not. And they can shift to any producer anywhere. If, 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 if they don't get what they want in Vietnam, they'll go to, to Bangladesh to get what they want, and they'll, they'll go somewhere else what they want. In other, in other words, they, they, they can move around precisely because they are the merchant capitalist. They have a different kind of, different kind of set of possibilities, like I, I mentioned. Uh, about, you know, the merchants, the merchant, you know, the commodity can crawl around like the caterpillar. Uh, the producers in the chrysalis and can't move. And, 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 and the, the power relation between them then becomes very important. So the, 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 the caterpillar can go and, and of course money capital can flit around wherever it wants. The butterfly of the thing, you know, can flit around wherever it wants. So, you know, but, but there's an interesting kind of question here, which relates to the story in Volume 1. Uh, in Volume 1, Marx talks about all kinds of labour processes, this is in the, and he talks about hybrid situations, and there's absolutely no question that in Volume 1, Marx tends to take a rather teleological position that, yeah, there are all these kind of uh, small firms around and handicraft industries and so on, and yes, they can be organized in different ways, but in the end, the factory system is going to dominate. I mean, I, there's a teleological argument in Volume 1 of that sort. And in the end, it's all going to be like one big factory system. Now, I argued in Volume 1, for those of you can, who can remember what I argued, and I can actually remember for once what I argued. <laughs> I argued in Volume 1 that actually what Marx does is to suggest that all, the domestic system, the handicraft system, they all exist, and they all are in, the, in, in that same British world. And the Tower Hamlets argument here is very interesting, because in Tower Hamlets you get this system in Marx's time where the merchant can pull the strings of all of these small producers. Now, when I was doing my study of, of Paris industry at this time, it was all organized as, as small producers with merchants, hegemonic, pulling. And Marx actually talks about it in a very telling way in Volume 1 of Capital. He says, in that system, the merchant sort of can pull a thousand different strings and pull it all together, a whole kind of network. And there's some wonderful descriptions of, of, of what that was like. I mean, if you go and read, uh, Zola's uh, L'Assommoir. There's, there's the guy, there's a guy, there's a family, just, just a family, a, a guy and his wife who are, are making gold chain. In the beginning of the month, 
the merchant comes with a bit of gold. By the end of the month, he comes and collects the gold chain. And the amount of gold they have and has to be transformed into a length, that length of gold chain. And all they do is sit there going through gold chain, you know. And uh, Gilda kind of says, you know, they they spun enough gold chain to actually stretch from uh, from Paris to Versailles, you know. I mean, it, 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 but 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 the description of the of the of the labor process, but it's a merchant capital organized thing of the sort that Marx is talking about in Tower Hamlets. Now, the interesting thing is, if you went into Tower Hamlets, and if you go into Tower Hamlets to this day, it's still like that. It really is. And and that system never went away. And, and actually, if you look at the organ typical organization of industrial activity in Hong Kong, it's always been this way. And the difference between Hong Kong and Singapore is Singapore, it's the other way, the producers are in charge, and, and in Hong Kong the merchants are in charge. And it's completely different industrial structures. And my argument would be, look, you cannot say that that labor system is going to drive out all of the others. And in fact, the argument I made about Volume 1, in fact, I think we've had a history where these different labor systems are utilized strategically by capital, when it, whichever which one is working best for them. And the big problem with the factory system, which Marx correctly identified, was when you put all the workers in a factory, what do they do? They make a union. <laughs> and they start creating a ruckus. And so South Korea, which went in the path of industrialization, big factories, ends up with a strong labor movement. Hong Kong, strong labor movement in Hong Kong? Forget it. You know? So capitalists were not daft. In 1970, faced with you know, strong labor movements, one of the things they did was to go back to this kind of system. So I, 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 it relates to the volume one argument where Marx has that teleology. And I think there's a teleological element in his argument here. Which I don't agree with. I mean, I, I may be deluded, you know, but I don't, I, I don't agree with it. I mean, I, I, I think when Marx gets into that teleological mode and said, well, there's an inevitable movement here in which eventually, you know, all merchant capitalists are going to remain, you know, be rendered subordinate. But there is still an element of truth in it. And the element of truth in it is this, and which is, I think, one of the things that is getting, you're getting at in the questions. That the merchant capitalist is still subordinated to what? to the production of surplus value. Okay. So there's a sense in which merchant capital, which used to go off and do all these predatory things, you know, and still does all those predatory things, by the way. That's the other interesting thing about merchant capital these days. Merchant capital does all these predatory things, you know. But at the end of the day, merchant and Nike is, is subordinate to the production of surplus value, even if it's the others who are producing the surplus value. In other words, Marx's argument here is, is, is that actually merchant capitalists live by getting a chunk of the surplus value. Well, they're not going to be able to live unless surplus value is produced. So they have to maintain a capitalist form of the production of surplus value and make sure, and this is I think one of the things you're kind of pointing to, is to kind of say, well, it's not as if they're indifferent to what's going on over there. They're not indifferent at all. They want surplus value to be produced. And this would be the delusion that somehow or other they are the ones who are producing surplus value. Nike does not produce any surplus value whatsoever. Okay. It lives on the surplus value produced in those factories in Southeast Asia and uh, you know. Benetton doesn't produce any surplus value whatsoever. It's dependent entirely on the production of surplus value elsewhere. So in, in, there is, a, a, I think, an elemental truth to what Marx is saying here, which is that the production of surplus value is, 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 has, has to take precedence over all else. In that sense, they are subordinate. But they're not <coughs> subordinate to that faction of capitalists called producers. The power has shifted. And it's shifted for strategic reasons over the last 30 years as a labor control measure. One of the points uh, here, of course, is that, as he says uh, at the opening of uh, chapter 16, one of the things that comes up uh, is a language where he talks about commercial capital, and the language he uses is independent and autonomous. And he uses that a lot 
in what follows. So we're really dealing with a situation in which uh, commercial capital is being understood as independent and autonomous, but uh, subordinate. And I think that's the kind of interesting language. I don't have any problem with that formulation, by the way. Uh, after all, that's the condition of the laborer, right? I mean, they're independent and autonomous, but they're also subordinate. So the interesting question that arises is, is, is merchant capital is subordinate to what and to whom? So what Marx is doing is in, in really uh, sort of uh, looking at that. Now he has to deal with one other problem, uh, which is that uh, uh, merchant capitalists were often involved, of course, historically in transport, and transport is productive of value. So that if we take a, you know a clipper ship which is going from China to to to, to Britain. Uh, carrying goods, uh, then uh, yeah, the merchant capital is capitalist is doing it and is in charge of it. But the merchant <coughs> capitalist is also engaging in production because you know uh, Marx's argument that transport is part of the production process and change of location. So he's very explicit uh, and uh, about uh, this that we assume away all these other functions. Um, so he then kind of says, well, and of course, uh, capitalist, industrial capitalists, he says at the bottom of 380, actually trade with each other directly. I'm not concerned with that. And uh, so he, he's sort of sidelining a whole bunch of uh, issues uh, to get to the core of what he wants to talk about, which is to uh, answer the question. What then is the relationship between this commodity dealing capital and commodity capital as a mere form of existence of industrial capital? That's on the bottom of 381, about well, two thirds of the way down on 381. And his point here is that the, the, the buying and selling that goes on here uh, is, uh, has, to be, has to be looked at uh, in a very special way. The capitalist has, has got the money, but the commodity is still in commodity form, it hasn't gone to its final destination. And as he says right at the bottom of 381, nothing has happened to the linen except a change in the person of its owner. There's a lot of exchanging of linen in capital. I wonder. <laughs> I, I sometimes think there should be a map of the, <laughs> of the exchange of linen going on in this text. But anyway, it's nothing has happened to it except a change in the person of the owner. Uh, in 382, the function of selling the linen and facilitating the first phase in this metamorphosis has been taken over from the producer by the merchant and transformed into his special business, whereas it was formerly a function that remained for the producer himself to perform after he had completed the function of producing it. Now this is a, 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 a peculiar kind of thing. The basic line of argument Marx has is that money is used to buy commodities, labor power, means of production, goes into production, then we get the production of a commodity, which is, has surplus value, and then it goes into the money plus. And, and the argument he's making here is that there is an intervention uh, in this transformation in which somebody out here has money, buys the commodity, then sells it again for money form, and gets a little bit of delta M. What this does is subtract, let's call this delta M M, i.e. the delta M that the merchant gets, right? In a way this is a cir circulation process which goes on here, in which the merchant is perpetually extracting a certain amount delta M for themselves. Which of course means that what is left for the capitalist directly is, is delta, delta M for the capitalist minus that which is taken by, by the merchant capitalist. And Marx talks about this and, and says, well, you know. What we have here is a form of circulation which is sort of MCM, which is 
entering in, and this is the circuit of merchant capital. And this is the general circulation of industrial capital. And of course this then means that this guy then comes back in and, and goes back and again means the production, labor power, etc., etc., and the merchant capitalist comes back into the picture again. And he does use an example of kind of saying, well, once the merchant capitalist has taken the commodity, if they haven't sold it, how can they possibly take another batch of commodities before they've sold this to whoever they have to sell it to? So this is, if you like, the general framework that he's setting up. What this in effect means, of course, is that the, the merchant capitalist is actually a money capitalist, really, because they have to have the money uh, to start off with, and so they are in the MCM. So this is why there's an overlap between what the merchant does. And, you know, they then hold the, the the commodity for a little bit, and then they, you know, as presumably they want to get rid of it as soon as they can in order to get back into the money form, but. <coughs> Marx will talk about the way in which this circuit here, this circulation process here, is radically different from the turnover time of this circulation process here. And so this is, I think, one of the, the features uh, of what commercial capital is about. Now, why does this occur, and what are the advantages uh, of the inter this intervention? And Marx starts to talk about the way in which, well, of course, it means that the industrial capitalist can, doesn't have to hold uh, the commodity for any length of time. They get rid of it immediately, and somebody else has to be bothered with getting rid of it and turning it into money. So they get money even though they don't get as much as they should, uh, and it gives continuity. And there are a number of elements, I think, and Marx goes through here, and I'm not sure I think it's worthwhile going through all of the details, except to get to the end of the chapter, where Marx is going to be very clear, saying the following, uh, and I think we can just summarize this chapter on 392, 393. Commercial capital is nothing more than capital functioning within the circulation sphere. The circulation process is one phase in the reproduction process as a whole. But in the process of circulation, no value is produced, and thus also no surplus value. That's the rule. He says the same value simply undergoes changes of form. Nothing at all happens except the metamorphosis of commodities, which by its very, its very nature has nothing to do with the creation or alteration of value. If a surplus value is realized on the sale of the commodity produced, this is because it already existed in the commodity. Okay, that's the crucial thing. And then Bottom of the page. Commercial capital thus creates neither value nor surplus value, at least not directly. And then you come to the reasons why this is useful from the standpoint of the industrial capitalist. Insofar as it contributes towards shortening the circulation time, of industrial capital that is, it can indirectly help the industrial capitalist to increase the surplus value he produces, insofar as it helps to extend the market and facilitates the division of labor between capitals, thus enabling capital to operate on a bigger scale. Its functioning promotes the productivity of industrial capital and its accumulation. So, by shortening the circulation time, recall that shorter circulation times allow greater, you know, greater profit, aggregate profit. So, even though you lose this bit of the of the surplus value, and you give that to the you 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 actually shorten all of this instead of this taking, instead of this taking this this much, uh, this takes almost instantaneously, and so you actually save that time, and so you can then get back into this buying and selling immediately straight away. So you're going to in in the end of the year you're going to have produced more surplus value, and you've given up some surplus value to the to the commercial capitalist so that you can produce more surplus value yourself by shortening your turnover time. And then of course there's the question of extending the market and facilitating the division of labor between capitals, that 
of course, merchant capital can start to actually introduce a scale into uh, activity, and of course, merchant capitalists will not only deal with one capitalist, one industrial capitalist, they can deal with many. Uh, and and, and uh, then it goes on to say, insofar as it cuts down the turnover time, it increases the ratio of surplus value to the capital advanced, i.e., the rate of profit. And insofar as a smaller part of capital is confined to the circulation sphere as money capital, it increases the portion of capital directly applied in production. That is, this, this circulation process here, C into, you know, that the capitalist goes through, C into M into C again, uh, is, is, is um, not only it's the turnover time, but also there's a hoarding of money which goes on in there for the individual capitalist. Now you don't have to hoard money. So for all of these particular reasons, the efficiency which the uh, merchant capitalist brings to turnover time, to diminishing the, the need for money hoards, and, and uh, to, if you like, ex also taking care of, a, of, a, of a, an expansion of the market, all of those kinds of questions uh, means that this is actually, you know, very uh, uh, a significant uh, addition. Uh, to the power of industrial capital to produce surplus value. So, you know, you lose a bit, but you gain a much more. I mean, that's the general kind of uh, theory that's going on here. And the result can be a general increase in the rate of, uh, of, of profit. So, is, is there anything else going on in this chapter that anybody wants to raise? I don't think it's a difficult, too difficult uh, an idea. So, chapter 17, commercial profit. So again we have the an announced thing that we saw in Volume 2, that the pure functions of capital in the circulation sphere create neither value nor surplus value. Uh, but uh, the time taken in, the, in this sphere, this goes back to what I was just saying, the time <coughs> these operations require sets limits to the formation of value and surplus value objectively as far as the commodities are concerned, and subjectively as regards the capitalist. So here we are back, but we've now got to say something about what is, what is the rate of, what is commercial profit about? And again on uh, 395, he says, commercial capital therefore stripped of all the heterogeneous functions that may be linked to it, such as storage, dispatch, transport, distribution, and retailing, and it's very important to remember that merchant capital in Marx's theoretical apparatus, they all belong in production. <laughs> this, is, this is merchant cap capital is what's left over after all that's taken out. Creates neither value nor surplus value, but simply facilitates their realization. Uh, and the transfer from one hand to another. But the problem here is that a merchant capitalist would not obviously would obviously not engage in this practice unless they could gain at least the average rate of profit, just as much as capital functions in the various branches of production. If commercial capital were to yield a higher average profit than industrial capital, a part of industrial capital would change into commercial capital. If it yielded a lower average profit, the opposite process would take place. No species of capital finds it easier than commercial capital to change its function and designation. That is, precisely because it starts in the money form, it's always open for it, at some point or other, to kind of go, OK, I'm going to go back in here and become a producer. So the merchant capitalist has, has, has options always to do that. So there is a suggestion that goes on here that um, there is an equalization of the rate of profit between industrial capital and merchant's capital. Now, um, this could pose some particular difficulties to taking on this part of Volume 3 without having done the preceding parts, because some of the chapters that come earlier in Volume 3 are precisely about the equalization of the rate of profit. And if we have time at the end, maybe I'll talk a little bit about what goes on there. I don't think actually it really matters here, because you can actually follow the argument without going through the rather tortuous stuff that actually arises out of the equalization of the rate of profit, which is one of the big complexities in Marxian theory. 
So if you want to get into that, be my guest, you know, but uh, I think we can. But nevertheless, Marx's general point in that chapter is that capital flows uh, to wherever the rate of profit is highest, and in an equilibrium situation, the profit rate should be equalized between all sectors of production, from agriculture to industry to, you know. But that also in includes, of course, uh, merchant capital. So merchant capital should get, uh, become part of uh, the, rate, the rate of profit. But the general kind of question is, um, what does this, exactly what does this, this mean and how does this occur? So on 397 he um, goes through a confusing thing which is the, the negative case in which uh, merchant's capital does not enter into the formation of the general rate of profit. Uh, and uh, Marx, Marx doesn't like that argument, uh, and so he starts at the very bottom of page 397, he says, in connection with commercial capital, on the other hand, we are dealing with a capital that takes a share in profit without participating in production. So it's now necessary, therefore, to supplement the earlier presentation. And what he does is essentially say this, that if this guy starts off uh, with, uh, say, 900 pounds, and, and then there's a general rate of profit, what in effect you do uh, is to kind of say, well, actually, if this guy starts off with 100 pounds, then you really should add the 100 pounds to this, and, and therefore, this is a sort of a fiction that Marx is engaging in, that it really is like an original input, and that if this 900 uh, produced, I'm trying to remember his figures now, if this produced a 20% rate of profit, uh, the 900, when you combine the two you end up with, with an 18% rate of profit. So that the input of the money capital uh, that comes from the merchant capitalist in order to engage in realization is treated as if it is part of the initial in input. And so the point of these calculations on page 398, 399 uh, is uh, simply to show how uh, the 900 go goes to 1000 and we get a lower rate of uh, profit. And this leads to the conclusion, just at the bottom of 399, the whole of the surplus value or profit is not yet realized in the price of the commodity as realized by industrial capital. The merchant's sale price is higher than his purchase price, not because it is above the total value, but rather because his purchase price is below this total value. And that follows from the fact that they're getting a part of the, of the, of the surplus value. So, says Marx, the general rate of profit thus already takes account of the deduction from the surplus value which falls to commercial capital, i.e. a deduction from the profit of industrial capital. It follows from this, he says, that the bigger commercial capital is in comparison with industrial capital, the smaller the rate of industrial profit and vice versa. He then goes through what that might mean. So, Again, you get back into the historical movement a bit, uh, bottom of 400, 401, and gets back into the circulation of uh, the, the, the merchant's capital, which is the M into M plus delta M. In the middle of page 401 says, his sale price, as analyzed above, equals m plus delta m, this delta m representing the addition to commodity price determined by the general rate of profit. So this is now understood as the general rate of profit. And that is equalized, this has to be equalized uh, to this. The, the, the delta M minus this, so it has to be e equal, to, equal to that. So the general rate of profit is equalized between the industrialist and, and the producer. Now again, this comes back to what we were discussing before, which is the, you know, the question is, well, 
is, it, is the general rate of profit equalized? In a, in a theoretical kind of world which Marx is in all the time, which is this perfection of markets, I guess it would be. But it would seem to me that this is not necessarily uh, the case uh, at all, particularly given uh, the monopoly power that often merchant capital starts to exercise um, around the thing. Now, this then raises some very important uh, issues. Uh, okay, w what, what happens to the costs of merchant capital, the four fray that we discussed way back? What happens to the costs? Well, obviously, this operation that the uh, merchant capital does, engages in is not costless. So there are necessary costs of, of, in, of this circulation process, and they have to be incorporated into an understanding of what the amount of money is that's being invested in, uh, in merchant capital. So that is uh, something that has to be uh, taken into account. But then it seems to me the most intriguing part of this chapter is, well, what about the wage labor employed <coughs> by the merchant? And he starts to get onto this on 406. Of course, the merchant could be just the laborer. So just work, you know, the merchant could work uh, on his or her own, and, and just that would be it. But he then goes on, Marx then goes on to sort of suggest that this is, a, this is not a really a feasible option, because capital output is growing. Uh, if, if the only kind of merchant is the single merchant, you know, household or something like that, then you know, it's not going to really work very effectively in relationship to the, what is really required of efficiency and, 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 and speed and all this kind of stuff. So you have to start to apply labor, and the evidence that Marx suggests is that the tendency is for merchant capital to become very large. Uh, precisely because there's a lot of products out there. The more products they handle, the more they can deal with the fact that this, this firm has produced so much and then gets a hiccup and hasn't produced anything this month, but then Another firm has produced it so you can kind of smooth out all of these different uh, transactions. So the merchant has all kinds of uh, important uh, uh, possibilities. Uh, and then Marx goes over those on page 409, which, where he starts to talk about economies of scale. Uh, and, and, and the economies of scale, of course, also apply to the employment of labor. And then Marx gets into this really peculiar kind of a uh, set of production where you get a capital B and a lowercase b, and then one is minus the other, and so on. And after a while, I, I don't know how your brain was spinning with that one, but mine spun quite a bit, and so I kind of do what I often do, say, well, what does this all mean? And so you go to a passage at the end which sort of explains it. <laughs> uh, um, and and this is, it, does, it does explain it quite well at the bottom of 4.11. He says, okay. And, and this is about the buying and selling of labor power, because labor power is obviously being employed. Uh, labor is being exploited, but it's not producing surplus value. So how do you, you know, wh wh how do you then start to um, incorporate that? Um, so Marx says at the bottom of 411, what the merchant buys with lowercase b, according to our assumptions, is merely commercial labor, i.e. labor needed for the functions of capital circulation, c into m and m into c. But commercial labor is the, that l is the labor that is always necessary for a capital to function as commercial capital, for it to mediate the transformation of commodities into money and money into commodities. It is labor that realizes values but does not create any. And only insofar as a capital performs these functions, i.e., insofar as a capitalist performs these operations and this labor with his capital, does cap this capital function as commercial capital? and take part in settling the general rate of profit by drawing its dividends from the total profit. So, in effect, what the, what the laborer is doing is being exploited, but being exploited in such a way that the merchant capitalist has the capacity to use more money to engage in this kind, kind of process. And the more, more the merchant capitalist can exploit labor in this process, uh, the, the, the more the equalization of the rate of profit 
the more it enters into the equalization of the rate of profit in a certain kind of way. So the, 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 the excess which the merchant's capital is getting is to some degree factoring in the exploitation of living labour in this process, which does not, however, contribute to the overall production of surplus value. I mean, in the same way that costs are deductions out of surplus value, we have to look at this always as deductions out of surplus value, rather than actually producing surplus value, even though labour in this case is, is, uh, um, is uh, exploited. So this is, if you like, the logic of the argument that he sets up, and then on the bottom of 4.12 again he summarises uh, all of these costs by sort of saying, since commercial capital is nothing at all but the form in which a part of the industrial capital functioning in the circulation process has become autonomous, Notice this autonomous idea again. All questions relating to it must be resolved in this way. The problem must at the outset be put in the form in which the phenomena peculiar to commercial capital do not yet appear independently but are still in direct connection with the industrial capital of which commercial capital is a branch. Commercial capital with an office instead of a workshop functions continuously in the circulation process. And he then goes back to this question of what happens when labour is employed within, the, within industrial capital as to engage in these, these merchant-type functions. Um, and, and then a bit further down, in the middle of 4.13, the more the scale of production grows, the greater are industrial capital's commercial operations, although the increase is by no means in the same proportion, and the greater also the labour and other circulation costs involved in the realisation of value and surplus value. Then further down, it increases the outlays of the industrial capitalist, the mass of capital he has to advance without directly increasing the surplus value. And again, this is about really taking the, the position that imagine how this system works without this. Imagine that all of that is internalized within industrial capital, and what would you see? You would see growing costs which are attached to realization, both in terms of turnover time, employment of labor all of that kind of thing. So the case for a specialised group out here that can economise, uh, on, on get economies of scale and labour and, and all the rest of it becomes, I think, very, very significant. This leads to the conclusion in the middle of 4.14, when he's talking about the commercial worker, and says we does not produce surplus value directly, his wage, therefore, does not stand in any necessary relationship to the amount of profit that he helps the capitalist to realise. What he costs the capitalist and what he brings in for him are different quantities. What he brings in is a function not of any direct creation of surplus value, but of his assistance in reducing the cost of realising surplus value, which of course real releases more money to make more surplus value, insofar as he performs labour, part of it unpaid. So the more he's un the, the labour is unpaid, the more it releases money to produce surplus value in the normal process. Marx then suggests that the commercial worker proper belongs to the better paid class of labourers. He's one of those whose labour is skilled labour above average labour. But he then goes on to say, but at the bottom there, because basic skills, knowledge of commerce and languages, etc., are reproduced ever more quickly, easily, generally and cheaply, the more the capitalist mode of production adapts teaching methods to practical purposes, the general extension of popular education permits this variety of labour to be recruited from classes which were formerly excluded from it and were accustomed to a lower standard of living. With few exceptions, therefore, the labour power of these people is devalued with the advance of capitalist production. Their wages fall, whereas their working ability increases. The capitalist increases the number of these workers if he has more value and profit to realise. The re increase in this labour is always an effect of the increase in surplus value and never a cause of it. So much for the white collar worker. <laughs> so Marx then gets into a bit into the turnover of, of, of commercial capital, and, and again, um, the, the point here is to say that the turnover of this capital operates in a very different kind of rhythm than the turnover of this capital, even though part of the impact of that turnover is to shorten the turnover of industrial capital. That is one of the, the, the big impacts.
And so what Marx is doing here is, is, is setting this up. But again, what ca happens here is that uh, the whole kind of question of the speed of circulation and acceleration and what is the relationship, how does uh, merchant capital adapt, commercial capital adapt to the need uh, to, to accelerate uh, the circulation process. And of course this, the modern credit system comes in uh, and uh, when Marx mentions it and then gets out of it uh, once more. <coughs> um, but we get also the possibility uh, in here of crisis formation, uh, which is I think uh, uh, worth looking at. And this really starts in the sort of middle of 418. So he says, the repeated turnover of commercial capital is never anything more than a repetition of buying and selling, whereas the repeated turnover of industrial capital expresses the periodicity and renewal of the entire reproduction process, including the process of consumption. For commercial capital, this is simply an external condition, industrial capital must constantly put commodities on the market and withdraw them from it again if the rapid turnover of commercial capital is to remain possible. If the reproduction process is generally slow, so is the turnover of commercial capital. Now commercial capital certainly facilitates the turnover of productive capital, but it only does this insofar as it cuts down the ladder's circulation time. It has no direct effect on the production time, which also forms a barrier to the turnover time of industrial capital. This is the first limit, and this is where we get this language of limit and barriers and disruptions. This is the first limit to the turnover of commercial capital, that is the production time involved in industrial capital. Secondly, however, quite apart from the barrier formed by reproductive consumption, this turnover is decisively restricted by the speed and volume of the total individual consumption, since the overall part of the commodity capital that goes into the consumption fund depends on this. So you have to get consumers to consume as fast as possible. So one of the difficulties that the merchant capitalist faces is to dispose of the commodity capital. And you can only dispose of it if there's a demand for use values out there. And that demand has to be backed also by ability to pay. So this creates a potential barrier in the circulation process. And the Mar so Marx goes on to say, leaving aside completely the turnovers within the world of commerce, where one merchant after the other sells the same commodity. A kind of circulation which may present a very flourishing appearance in periods of speculation. Commercial capital first of all abbreviates the phase CM for productive capital. And then comes the stuff about the modern credit system. And then it goes on to, given the tremendous elasticity of the reproduction process, which can always be driven beyond any given barrier, he finds no barrier in production itself, or only a very elastic one. Besides the separation of CM and MC, which follows from the nature of the commodity, an active demand is now therefore created. Despite the autonomy it has acquired, and this comes back to something we were mentioning earlier, it may be autonomous but it's also dependent. In spite of the autonomy it has acquired, the movement of commercial capital is never anything more than the movement of industrial capital within the circulation sphere. And that is still true, I think for Nike and everybody else. And this is where the dependency does look the other way. It's a complex interdependency. You know. But by virtue of this autonomy, its movement is within certain limits, independent of the reproduction process and its barriers, and hence it also drives this process beyond its own barriers. This inner dependence in combination with external autonomy drives commercial capital to a point where the inner connection is forcibly re-established by way of a crisis. Now, what's, what's going on here? Uh, and it just elaborates. This explains the phenomenon that crises do not first break out and are not first apparent in the retail trade, which bears on immediate consumption, but rather in the sphere of wholesale trade as well as banking, which places the money capital of the entire society at the wholesaler's disposal. The point here is that what, what you're seeing is, if you, you can presume that everything is smooth in here, but these guys, the merchant capitalists, are 
our, our inner circulation kind of process, and they can be accelerating in a certain way and try to put pressure back into this system to accelerate the production time. If they can't do that, or if they face a blockage in their final consumption, then they can actually precipitate a general crisis within the system. Now again, this is something which I, is very important to, to recognize, which is that, that crises can form all over the place in this system. I mean, you, you're coming up across it again and again and again. Okay, you have a specific form of the crisis here, which has everything to do with the way in which uh, this circulation of, of, of merchants' capital is, is sort of locked into this other form of circulation. And if they don't gel exactly, and if they're dynamic, and this is expanding and that is not uh, adapting rapidly enough, you get a crisis. If this is, ex is accelerating and this is not expanding, you know, there are all kinds of uh, ways in which these, uh, these things can start to move independently of each other, precisely because of the autonomy and the independence. In other words, this couldn't happen unless they were autonomous and independent. It wouldn't happen if uh, all of these operations were internalized within the capitalist firm. It's only when you get this, this, this autonomous and independent that these forms of commercial crises can, can happen. And you can see why they might, uh, might happen, and Marx is uh, sort of talking about this in, this in this chapter. And I think that, again, this is the chapter in which on 428 he comes back to the notion of the fetish view, which would attach to the independence and autonomy of this, a condition of non-dependency. And I think what Marx is kind of saying is that, you know, going back to the, the general argument, the condition of dependency is a very, uh, very important to establish and understand what it is that commercial capital is dependent upon. And as, 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 as you folk were saying uh, early on, uh, earlier on, you know, it, you can't imagine a merchant capital which is entirely autonomous and independent and not, you know, and not subordinate to something, some rules of the game. And what, what is it subordinate to? Well, it's, support, it's subordinate to uh, the, the, the circuit of industrial capital. And it cannot operate except internally within that, within that logic. And this is what I think what Marx is trying to do here is to kind of say, well, you know, the illusion you would have, I mean, it's like when he kind of says uh, about the circuit of money capital, you know, it, it seems as if that is what capital is really about. Um, but you, as he says about that, you'd be deluded if you think, thought that. And the same would be true of merchant capital, even if merchant capital uh, happens to be in a rather hegemonic uh, position. So this chapter then uh, is, I think, uh, uh, about these divergent uh, turnover processes which interlock with each other in a sort of an uncomfortable kind of symbiosis uh, which can sometimes break down in uh, a crisis form. And that then leads Marx to sort of say, well, you know, the crisis is ultimately a crisis of the circulation of industrial capital as a whole. And you have to look at it in those terms rather than thinking simply uh, of it as, as something that is coming out of the market and purely exists in, in, in the market world. There's an interesting kind of passage at the top of 429 where he talks about, <coughs> he's talking about that passage I read earlier about the ideas of the manufacturers uh, and the merchant, the stock jobber and banker are necessarily quite upside down, uh, when he talks about competition. Competition necessarily plays in their minds a completely upside down role. If the limits of value and surplus value are given, it is easy to perceive how the competition between capitals transforms values into prices of production and still further into commercial prices transforming surplus value into average profit. But without these limits there is absolutely no way of seeing why competition should reduce the general rate of profit to one limit rather than to another. 
to 15 percent instead of 1,500 percent. It can at most reduce it to one level, but there is no, absolutely no element in it that could determine this level itself. Now this is a kind of interesting thing, because this is a distributive arrangement. The average rate of profit is something which is actually fluctuating, uh, but does not have any, any kind of absolute limit. It can be all over the place. So why is it 15 percent, not why 1,500 percent? Marx is kind of saying there is no way in which the level of the profit can be determined in advance. <coughs> At what level of profitability capital operates is really a conjunctural issue. And, and therefore, you cannot actually arrive at a theoretical. I mean, you can't take Marx's theory and say, therefore, 15% rate of profit. You can't say that. You can take his theory and say it's very important that the profit rate be equalized, but where it's equalized at is due to the play of social forces and other, other elements uh, within the situation. And as you we we'll probably know there is a falling rate of profit theory in the f first part of uh, volume three, where Marx is talking about force, you know, forces which are being created, which are beginning to push the profit rate in a certain kind of direction. Uh, but the profit rate uh, can operate in different kinds of ways, and as you will recall, also, also from volume one, there is a discussion there on whether the rate of surplus value or the mass of surplus value is what matters. And it's clear that the mass of surplus value is what matters. And Marx introduces the same thing here about the rate of profit, which is not the same as the surplus value, but we can keep them as parallel at this particular point in the argument. And he says at the bottom of 429, small profits and quick returns appears to the shopkeeper as a principle that he follows on principle. That is, you can have a, a small rate of profit, but if you have a rapid circulation process at the end of the year, you've accumulated a vast amount of money on, on very small profit margins. I mean, this is what goes on on Wall Street, right? I mean, they can get a profit margin on a trade of something like 0.0001% or something like that, even more zeros for all I know. And they're content with that because the speed at which they are circulating their money capital is so fast that at the end of the year they've got themselves a billion dollars, and the, the size of their trade. So, so a small profit rate, so if, if you went into Wall Street and said, you guys have got a very high rate of profit, they might turn to you and say, no, I'm only making 0.00001% out of my trading. And you kind of say, oh, poor guy, you should raise your rate of profit. <laughs> But the point, the point, Marx's point is, you've got to, you've got to put in the, the speed of the speed of movement, in order to really understand what this rate of profit really means, and and so so you know, and he's very aware of that here, and and this is is, is I think one of the things that's uh, significant. Now, chapter 19 on on money dealing capital, he's merely pointing out that actually, this whole circulation process starts with money and ends with money, so. There's a sort of form of money dealing which is going on here, and that really uh, the commercial capitalist is a money dealer, uh, and it not only not only sort of looks after, and the result of that is you find people not only looking after the buying and selling of the commodities, you find people looking after the dispersal of the money, and and so we get the specialist function arising on 432. The capitalist always has to make payments to many people and receive money in payment from many people. This merely technical operation of monetary payment and its receipt itself constitutes work. And insofar as the money functions as means of payment, it makes it necessary for accounts to be drawn up and balanced. This work is a cost of circulation and not value-creating labour. It is cut down by being undertaken for the capitalist class as a whole by a special department of agents or capitalists. And on 433, uh, there is a division of labour here, commercial and, and money aspects of this circulation process, so it becomes a special business, he says at the top of 433. And because it is performed as a special business for the monetary mechanism of the entire class. Now this is very interesting. Performed for the entire class. 
it is concentrated and undertaken on a large scale. Now that immediately says to me, well, if it's concentrated and it's on a large scale and it's performed for the whole class, these must be some really powerful dudes in there, you know, I mean, they, 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 they must have a lot of power. And, and Marx is not con really concerned with power relations in any of this, which is one of the problems, I think. I'm, I, I want to read this and I want, to, I want him to get into power relations between the different factions of capital, he doesn't do that at all, but this would lay the basis for me to kind of say, <coughs> this is a power position they're obviously in. And this is uh, what he calls money-dealing capital, and he starts to, to talk about it. And of course, uh, it's very important in international trade. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's about, uh, you know, trade in gold. It, it gave rise to the bankers like the Rothschilds and the Barings and all the rest of it. And uh, <coughs> he kind of says, well, the goldsmiths functioned as bankers for the great part of the 17th century. Uh, they actually, the bankers look after the hoard, uh, they take care of the idle capital and act as cashiers, uh, and this, so this is a, a mediating role of the money changers really, and, 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 and the, 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 the simple bankers. So the money dealers and the commercial capitalists are really part and parcel of the same thing except they're operating at different points in this circle. The merchant's capitalist is converting this into the money. Uh, the, the, the money dealers are really looking after this part and of course feeding back the money into, into uh, the rest of the production process. So this is again uh, uh, the rise of a completely independent business, uh, but it's sort of something that can be identified simply by looking at the circulation process and what it's about. Um, so this is, if you like, uh, the money dealing capital side of things, it emerges almost naturally out of an analysis of commercial capital. But again, we come back to this kind of question which, which really preoccupies me as to what is the, the power relation between commercial capital, money dealers, producers, and, and uh, the like, and there are other elements in here which I think are uh, occasionally introduced um, on 4.30, he talk, he's talking about, uh, again, this is where competition is coming in, but right at the end of 4.30, he says, if conditions that enable him to have a quick, quicker turnover can themselves be purchased, e.g. the location of his sales outset, outlet, he may pay extra rent for this, i.e. a part of his surplus profit is transformed into ground rent. Now, I like that kind of stuff, you know, because again, I can build a whole kind of theory on it. Uh, but uh, ground rent suddenly comes in here, uh, which uh, we're not going to be able to deal with uh, in, this, in this class in general, but it's another distributive form uh, which says, well, you're not only dealing with financiers and, and merchants and uh, money capitalists, you're also dealing with landlords and rentiers and all the rest of it. So those power relations, it seems to me, are very critical for examining the exact nature of the kind of capitalist society we live in. Uh, but as we see in from these chapters, Marx is not really prepared to spend much time on, on, on those particularities of power relations. Uh, he's staying at this level, and I think, it is, I think you can see it's useful to stay at this level of generality, because you do see things which allow you to say, well, you know, Nike is a merchant capitalist, but they're not autonomous of the production of surplus value. In fact, they have to organize uh, make sure that whoever they're contracting with is producing enough surplus value to support them and have mechanisms to extract it. So it's, it then becomes a different kind of uh, analysis when you, when you start to look at the power relations, but there's a certain fundamental underlying truth that Marx is laying out uh, theoretically here, which I think is very useful uh, to, to consider and remember uh, all the bankers and financiers are deluded in terms of their self-perception, so don't read any of those accounts from Wall Street and believe they're telling you the truth, even when they think they're telling you the truth. I mean, they're not lying, they're telling you how it seems to be, and it seemed to be, and I think that's a very important aspect of this argument. Okay, I guess we're out of time, so we should uh, leave it there, okay? We don't meet for the next two weeks, because uh, you guys have a two-week vacation, <laughs> so, we have, so we have, you have two weeks to wallow in part five, and the confusions of part five.
but there is a historical chapter there. There is, there is a historical chapter, and the historical chapter is dynamite. It's great. <laughs>